Amen. All right, so, man, welcome. This is week two of our fall festival, and we're outside. Amen. Amen. Uh, this is so fun. This is what we pictured, sun shining, beautiful weather. We're going to cook out afterwards, so please stick around. We are, we are so, just so excited to be doing this. Uh, we're also in week two of a new sermon series called Life Together, and we're talking about community and diversity. And last week, we primarily talked about community, so if you missed that, check it out on our podcast or our YouTube channel, and this week, we're primarily going to be talking about diversity. Now, both of these things are hard. Uh, Neither one of these two things comes naturally to us as Americans, and particularly because of the, I I said this last week, and I, I want to say it again, it used to be that segregation was forced on us by law. It used to be that the laws of our land forced us where white people were over here, black people and people of color were over here. And that was an atrocious sin of our land. One of the saddest things, I think as God looks down on our country, is that now, oftentimes, more often than not, segregation is no longer illegal, but we choose it. Now we choose it, and particularly in the church, we, we choose it. Now, there's some reasons for this in the sense that we have a long history of oppression in our country, and there's a long history of what I call biblical injustice, stuff that goes against what God's heart is for justice and equity amongst people that still isn't fixed, that still isn't fixed in our country. And it's not like if you change the laws, everything's going to go back to like it should have been from the beginning. So praise God the laws are changed. But we have a lot of work to do in the church and in our society to get things to where God would have originally intended them to be, or at least the best we can do with what we have to work with now and today. But the this is what we're up against. This is what we're up against as a church that's trying to be multi-ethnic, a church that's trying to be anti-racist, is what does it look like today to have a, 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 a church and a, God's kingdom here on this earth of justice and equity, despite centuries of mistrust and centuries of inequity? Okay, so what I want to say, too, as we talk about this is... Um, the high level of understanding and respect that I have for the black church and for black churches and for ethnic churches and how important that has been in the history of our country. If you don't know this, the the reason there's black churches and black denominations and black seminaries is because throughout the course of our country's history, white churches simply didn't let black people in. White churches didn't let black people be pastors and and members and made them sit in the back and didn't allow them into the seminaries. And so because of racism and because of oppression, black people had no choice but to go and start their own denominations and their own seminaries. And those places and churches have been a place of refuge for people of color in our country, a place of safety and refuge where you don't have to code switch, where you're not under the, the, um, throughout the week, having to assimilate to a white culture at work and at school and in culture. And so I want to say that God has used ethnic churches and continues to uh, for, for an, to, to this day. Um, we believe at Mosaic that segregation was not God's design from the beginning, and we believe that he wants to reconcile the, the effects of sin, so sin is uh, if I go and, and, I, and I punch Steve, you know, in the face, and uh, then and, um, that's a sin. That needs to be reconciled, right? I, I ask him uh, to forgive me. He has a choice to forgive me or not. Um, he could forgive me, and then I punch him in the face again, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> One on the other, right? Um, you know, you, you can see that we may not be able to reconcile if, if this is a pattern <laughs> that I keep continuing, right? But God's heart is that I'd stop punching Steve in the face, right? And that, and that as I stop and as I have a heart change and, and I want to make things right, that Steve would be able to forgive me. And God's heart is that when it comes to diversity and multi-ethnicity, it's not just that white people say we're sorry, 
It's that we stop the injustices and that we try hard in the midst of all of our brokenness to say, what does what does equity and justice look like today? And how can a church, how can a church be a part of bringing that about? And so that's why we're here. That's what we're trying to do. We believe that that's God's heart for the church, despite the massive amount of sin that's been inflicted upon African Americans and all people of color um, by white people that are in charge in our country. And, and we'd like to see that change. So um, that's what I want to commit really my life to for the, uh, the, the however many years I have left is what does it look like for the kingdom of God to come to this earth that we believe that Jesus is our savior and we need his forgiveness for our sins, amen? And, and then in that, we're gonna look at this today, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself into our text that he then calls us into a life of obeying him and a life of showing the world uh, what God's intent for life is, and, and us going to God and say, we want to do it your way, God, not our way. So quickly, and you might wonder how this applies. It would help if I turn this on. Um, I want to show you here, because we're new, I think I need your help, Alan. I'm not sure if we're... Uh... So I want to show you quickly um, mosaic phase one of our org chart, okay? And the reason I want to show you this, one, we don't have member official membership yet. We don't have member meetings to go over this. This is what I want to, I want to show you how we're set up as a church, so you can see where we are and where we're trying to get to. So we're a church plant of the Evangelical Covenant Church, which is the name of a denomination. We're a part of what's called the Great Lakes Conference. Some of you were here a few weeks ago. My church planning coach, Phil Carr, preached. And so you see Phil here, and some of you have also met Alan Tumpkin. He is the supervisor of church planting for the Great Lakes Conference. One of the reasons... I, as a church planner, wanted to plant with the ECC is because they value the gospel, they value scripture, and they value racial equity. And that's rare to find. That's rare to find where you have denominations that are willing to talk about racial justice and willing to talk about what the church needs to look like to help remedy these things. So uh, in, in some ways, in phase one of a, of a church plant, you have a church planter and I'm recruiting people and, and recruiting leaders. And the ECC, they have what they call for a church plant, a transitional leadership team. And that's what you'll see on the bottom here. And our transitional leadership team is, is Joel and Victoria and Lucera, who's normally here. Can we give them a hand? Yes, thank you. And um, this team, we meet together, and they are my counsel for leading this church and for making decisions. The, the leadership, uh, I guess you could say, um, biblically, where, where we want to head to, eventually as a church plan, is you have a, a team of elders or overseers that are in charge of the church on a local level. Right now, you could see Alan, Phil, and myself as the group of three that make up that team. And what's important is, you, is that you see that the, the only way we can be an anti-racist church is to have multi-ethnic leadership. And true leadership, uh, that not just, not just in, in, in word. Um, and so this is where we are in phase one. And where we want to move to in phase two and three as, as we grow and develop as a church is to have a, an elder team or an overseer team, those are just biblical words for the leadership of a church, that really functions as co-pastors. So while I'm a senior pastor right now, my goal is to lose that title and we'd have a team of co-senior pastors, a team of co-pastors that's multi-ethnic. And so I just want to show you where we're at and where we're headed um, as as a church plant, as we seek to be a place of not just uh, diversity, but a place of justice and of true uh, anti-racism and bringing the gospel to uh, in, a, in a real, in a, in a fresh way. So um, last thing, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn you over to your, your groups again. And if you're new, welcome. We always do this where we break you up in your groups. You have a section leader who's going to lead you through some questions. And uh, by the way, we're launching in small groups next Thursday. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, and so we want to encourage you to, to, to come out for those. Um, and it's not, it's not going to be here. We've already given the info for that. So if you need that info, just make sure you come talk to me uh, before we're done. Um, but we have you seated in your sections for a reason. It's because we want you to get to know those people. We want you to start thinking about this stuff together. And we're going to talk about it more on Thursday night. But it is a risk as a church for us to do that. It's a risk in a diverse setting to say, hey, let's talk about these things Pe with, with people you don't know, people that might be a first-time guest. And everyone here, I want you to know that it is a risk and a responsibility for you as you head into these conversations. And normally we try to keep them pretty light. But if you haven't noticed, 
um, people don't agree uh, politically in our culture. Have you noticed that, anyone? Have you ever, ever seen that? Um, people don't know how to talk about things they disagree with. Have you noticed that? Um, and even theologically, have you noticed people don't agree? Have you noticed that? <laughs> people don't agree about their theology and their traditions of, even, of being a Christian. And so uh, we want you, and part of this even series is learning how to do life together, to approach these conversations humbly. And I promise you, the people in your section don't agree with you on everything that you think they agree with you on. Even the people that you've been a part of Mosaic with for a year don't agree with you on everything you think they agree with you on. And so uh, we, we enter into this saying, it's deep and it's hard and it's going to take humility on all of our parts to be, able to be able to do this together. And even for me as a white pastor, understanding the dominance of whiteness that has been in our country and in the church and saying, what does it look like to put that aside and to lead together and to do this together? And um, it's, a, it's a long journey. And that's why we have Victoria to help us. And that's why we put this in our mission statement and we're saying, this is what we value as a community. And that's what we're going to be talking about today from Scripture. So I'm going to turn you over to your, your section leaders for another five minutes. And I want you to talk about these two questions. And then after that, we'll jump into our text. So number one, what excites you the most about being in a multi-ethnic church? And the reason we use multi-ethnic, by the way, that's just the word most commonly used in church circles. You could say multicultural, multiracial. They all have pros. They all have cons. Just kind of bear with us. Um, you, get, you get the idea, right? Number two, what makes you nervous? about being in a multi-ethnic church? What makes you nervous or scared or apprehensive? Um, and again, if you're new, we do this every week. There's no pressure to share. We got big groups today in some circles. Um, don't feel like you have to share. You can just listen. And Josh will probably visit all four groups by the time we're done and contribute to each one. So you're good. You're good. All right, five minutes and we'll be back. All right. So we'll keep that going Thursday your, your section leaders are, are the same as small, our small group leaders, and so we're, we're excited to just keep building this community. So um, I said last week that doing a life of community is like swimming upstream. Remember that? Well, doing a life of community and diversity is like swimming up two streams, okay? It, it, is, it is no joke that our, our culture is built against us for both of these things. A quick recap. Last week, we talked about Hebrews 3, 13 to 15, and Hebrews 10, 23 to 25. And the author of Hebrews says to believers, you need to meet together daily and have community. That's a high bar, isn't it? Daily. And, and to encourage one another. Don't you need someone to encourage you to do the right thing? Someone to encourage you not to give up? Someone to encourage you to give you hope? That's what we're supposed to find in the church. And it talks about spurring one another on towards love and good deeds. And it says, don't be like those who have stopped meeting, but meet together regularly. So we talked about that last week. And I do think community was a little bit easier in the first century than it is today. Today, this deck is stacked against us to not be in community. Back in the first century, they were more of a collectivist, communal culture. But when it comes to diversity, I think diversity was just as hard in different ways in the first century as it was today. And I think we often miss that when we read the Bible. We often miss that when we read specifically the New Testament. So back in the first century, okay, let me start. In the Old Testament, you had God's chosen people, Israel, the Jews, Hebrews. Those are all the same people. If you hear Israelites, the Jewish people, Hebrews, that was God's chosen people to be a light to the whole world. And that's the story of the Old Testament. There was a group, if you weren't Jewish, you were what's called in the New Testament a Gentile. And a Gentile just means non-Jewish. So some of you here might be ethnically Jewish. You may have some ethnic Jewish blood in you. And you'd stem your bloodline all the way back to Abraham. I mean, that's incredible, right? But if not, you're a Gentile. And in the New Testament, Jews and Gentiles did not like each other. And there was a lot of hierarchy in culture. Uh, when it came to Christianity, so Jesus was a Jew, and he came to save the Jews and... The Gentiles. But guess what? Not all the Jews like that. 
They kind of like being on top. They kind of like having the Holy of Holies all to themselves and the inner circle with God. And as you went out in the temple, you had a court for the Gentiles, and they could know God, but not in the same intimate way that a Jewish person could know God. There's debates in the Bible. If you read the book of Acts, they're literally debating if Gentiles can even be Christians or not, right? So picture that for a second. We're, we have racism in our country, and it is rampant. They were debating if Gentiles could even be Christians. Like, Jesus is here, we believe in Jesus, but you all, we think you're so low that you, you can't even be good enough for Jesus, right? Now, on the other hand, the Gentiles ruled when it came to social, you know, the Romans, the Greeks, they ran society, and the Jews were a captive people. The Jews in the time of Jesus in the first century, they didn't have their own nation, they didn't have any power. They were a little, they had a little puppet king, Herod. I mean, it was a mess. They didn't have political power, and the Gentiles had political power. So you talk about a mess, let alone the first Christians were being killed by the Romans. And then you have, we have evidence in the New Testament of Roman soldiers who come to know Jesus, and they enter into the church. And how do you like sitting in the same section with the person that killed your brother? <laughs> they killed your mom for her faith. And now they're in your church. These are the messes that the first century church had to work through, okay? Now, when we talk about diversity, I want you to know I'm not talking about being multicolored. Multicolored where everyone assimilates into whiteness. That's not what we're talking about. We are talking about what does it look like to have equity and justice? What does it look like to move towards that and have that be a part of our discipleship? All right, let's open up Scripture. If you have a Bible, you're welcome to turn to Ephesians 2. We're going to have it up on the screen as well. Ephesians 2, starting in verse 8, is some very famous verses about the gospel. If you've been around church, you may have heard these verses. This is an invitation for people to believe in Jesus. And it says, For it is by grace you've been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now, I did a sermon on this back in February. Only a few of you probably were there. It was one of our preview services. But uh, if, you, if this sounds familiar, this is why. And this is a really key passage for us as a church, starting at 8 and, and moving on. And I won't get into that whole sermon now because I've already done it, and you can go find it. But uh, in my upbringing in the white evangelical church, we just stopped the sermon here. We memorized these verses. You got your candy, and you moved on. This is how you're saved, and it was the end of the sermon. That's wrong. Let me, hear, let me hear, hear me say that. That is wrong. That is wrong. Because when Paul wrote this in Ephesians 2, he didn't end the sermon here. Those little numbers, 8, 9, those were not in the original text. Paul had a lot more to say about what this is meant to lead you into. And uh, for whatever, I know, I know the reasons, uh, but we stopped the sermon there. Okay, we're not going to stop the sermon there today. Um, we, but I, I'm starting here because for us to do this work together, to be multi-ethnic church, all of us, no matter where you come from, no matter your background, no matter your culture, no matter your heritage, no matter your ethnicity, what, what society would call race, we have to see the centrality of Jesus in this, okay? Look, nobody can do this without Jesus leading the way. I, the, the world tries to do it, and, and what do you see? You see, a, you, you, it's a mess. It's a mess, right? And, and it's not to say that non-Christians can't, can't you know, give us lots of wisdom when it comes to this. But I'm saying that as a church, if, if we put our anti-racist vision above our Jesus vision, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. We're in trouble. But guess what? You don't have to choose one or the other. They're always meant to go together, which Paul lays out beautifully in this text. But we have to have Jesus because white people, we have to learn how to humble ourselves. We have to learn how to learn. We have to learn how to learn. And the only way to learn how to learn, to humble ourselves, the best way I know is to get in front of the throne of God <laughs> and to let his might and his glory and his light shine and go, God, I am humble before you, and I need to learn how to learn. What are the ways that my upbringing was wrong? That's hard. That takes humility to think about what were the ways that my upbringing were wrong. What are the ways that today's pundits the talking heads on TV that so many follow are wrong. What does it look like to give up power? What does it look like to even see power in the first place and acknowledge it and to say, this needs to be given up and it needs to be shared? This needs to be shared. That requires the gospel. 
So Galatians 5, it's a whole other sermon. I won't be able to get into it today. But the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5, the fruits of the Spirit are required for all of us to be able to do this work. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All are required. People of color, African Americans, Latina, Latino, Native Americans, Chinese, Japanese, all have been oppressed in this country. If you look through the history of our country, all have been oppressed. And it, it, I, I, I cannot get my head around the wounding that that does. And that continues to happen to this day and how hard it, w- it would be to even enter into this work with white people at times. The fruits of the Spirit are required for you as well. The fruits of the Spirit are required to be able to go, can I love? <laughs> can I have joy? Can I have peace? Can I have patience with these dumb white people? <laughs> okay? <laughs> Without leaving. With coming back. With saying, do they have the fruits of the Spirit? Are they trying to do this work? Do I have the fruits of the Spirit? Can we do this work together? This has to be central for us to be able to do this work as a church. Now, this heart change happens, but it doesn't end here. The heart change propels us into verse 10, the very next verse. The very next verse, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, let me just go back to what we just read. We've been saved by grace through faith. Why were we saved? To do good works. We're not saved by our works. We're saved so that we do good works. With our community sermon last week, I said that this is a team sport. Community is a team sport, okay? Now get ready for the purpose of the sport. Get ready for the purpose of the sport. Uh, I, I I, I, I mentioned this back in the, the February one, so I'm, um, let me see what I have. Uh, okay, I thought this was next. This is my high school football team, okay? It's a bad picture. Uh, I found it on a friend of mine's Facebook page, and I had to blow it up really big. Uh, this is me right here. And um, in high school, I was a really good bench sitter. I was really good at it. I was a really good bench sitter. I don't know if you can tell in this photo because it's, 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 it's the lighting out here is bad, but this was at the end of, I think we, we won conference. It's a big deal. Troy, Ohio, Southwest Ohio. Um, and this was our, all of our seniors. And in, I don't know if you can see up here, there's two different jerseys being worn. There's two different colored jerseys. Can you see the different colors? You got this like deep red here worn by William Block, star running back, and also had to play defense. See the deep red and the deep red here, Josh Mays, star, you know, defensive tackle, offensive lineman. And then there's another color jersey that we had, and it was this like bright cherry red. Do you see that one here that I'm wearing? I, I, I blew up uh, the next picture. Just g- so, so see, Steve's got it. He's, he's, Josh, he's testing me on that reconciliation thing. See, now you know why I've been punching him in the face. Uh, I got to wear a jersey, and Josh and, and Josh Mays and William Black, they got to play. <laughs> uh, they, they, went into, they went into war, and they sweated, and they got dirty. I don't know if you can tell here, like, this is my white sock, that's William's, what used to be a white sock, and then, like, I don't know what color those pants used to be. All right. This is not that different than our Christian faith, right? And a lot of you, how many own a jersey at home? I know we're not all sports people, but how many you own jerseys, okay? You bust your jersey out on the day of the game, and you're, what are you? You are a fan. You're a fan. You're a fan. You're not a player, okay? <laughs> you're, not, you're like, I got the jersey on, but I don't, I'm not putting the pads on. I'm not going out there. You can yell at the TV and be like, act like you could have made that play. No, uh, you couldn't have. No, you couldn't have. Trust me. You couldn't have. Uh, it's a big difference. And a lot of us look at following Jesus, and we, we got the jersey, 
and we say, I, I'm on the team. I got, I, I got this on, and, and we, because we believe in verses 8 and 9, for grace I've been saved. But we never do the rest of it. We never actually jump into the game and do what God wanted us to do the whole time. Okay? And that's what God wants us to do is to play. And the good news is there's no cuts on God's team. There's no starting lineup. You just choose if you want to go onto the field or not. You choose. You choose if you want to be in the game or not. The other good news is the, our team wins. Yeah. Our team wins, right? Amen? And you get to choose if, if when we celebrate, and I've been on both sides of it, when you celebrate and you're like, yeah, it's so fun to be on the team. Where's that free spaghetti? You know, like, what, you know what I mean? Like, versus... I made the win happen. Like, I was a part of the action. I got to be in on the win. That's a much better feeling. That's a much better feeling. All right, we got, we got, a, lot of, we got a lot of stuff to get to here in, uh, uh, in a short amount of time. So here's what I want to show you. Verse 10, I highlighted some words in yellow. For we are God's handiwork. The reason you're saved, there's a progression here. You're saved. You're actually created. Why were you created in Christ Jesus to do these good works? So we got to see the progression and go, I was saved by grace through faith. For I was created to do good works. And then it continues in verse 11, therefore. And it's going to tell you what to do next. There's a buildup here. The author wants you to feel the buildup. What's next? The coach is giving you the pregame talk. At this point, the team doesn't even know if it's going to go out and crochet, if it's going to go out and play chess, if it's going to go out and play badminton, volleyball, baseball. It doesn't even know what it's going to happen next. Right now, the coach is getting the team fired up. You're on the team. You're created to do good works. What are those good works? What are they? Verse 11 tells us, Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. All that is is fancy kind of cultural language for Jews and Gentiles. Jews were the circumcised. Gentiles would be the uncircumcised. You could, it's, it's, a, it's a whole thing in the Old Testament. Remember, verse 12, that at that time, you were separate from Christ, Gentiles, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise without hope and without God in the world. Talk about segregation, right? Without hope, Without God in the world, that's where the Gentiles found themselves. It continues in verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. This is great news, isn't it? This is great news that Gentiles can be saved. I mean, I wouldn't be able to be saved otherwise. This is great news. Now, here's the question practically. What do you do with two groups... Jews and Gentiles, that have despised each other for millennia, okay? They've despised each other for millennia, and now in Christ, they've both been brought near to God. What do you do practically? Well, obviously, you, you'd start a Gentile church for Gentiles, and all the Gentile Christians can do church over here, and they'll do it in the Gentile way. And, and obviously, you'd start a Jewish church over here, and all the Jews could keep doing all their Jewish traditions, and they would do Jewish church over here. Isn't that a great solution? And so if you're a Gentile and you want to know Jesus, you go to the Gentile church. And if you're a Jew, you want to know Jesus, you go to the Jewish church. We're like, yeah, that does sound like a great idea because we're Americans and that's what we do. <laughs> that is not God's design for the church. It wasn't his design in the first century. There, there's no, there, there's, there, so it's not his design for us today. And, and we, we put evangelism, we, we separate it out from kingdom living where we say, but yeah, but more people would, would know Jesus that way because you, would, you wouldn't have to worry about racism and, and this, this hatred between the two groups. You could just talk about Jesus. Jesus wants us to do more than just talk about Jesus. Jesus wants us to live like Jesus. He wants us to go from talking about Jesus to living like Jesus. I'm not making this up. It's all right here in the text. Verse 14, for he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility." Whew. This is why we exist as Mosaic Church. 
This is why we exist as Mosaic Church. One new humanity, brothers and sisters. Out of the two, making peace, one body, putting to death their hostility. The cross is to put to death humankind's hostility towards God and towards each other. These very distinct ethnicities that are, that are brimming with racism, brimming with inequity, coming together as one body, one new humanity. It doesn't end here. It doesn't end here. It continues. These are exciting verses. I know it looks like a lot, but follow along. This wraps up this section. He came, Jesus, and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, that's the Old Testament, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord, and in him you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Let's go, right? I mean, this is what we are to be on this earth, to be a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit, being built together, Jews and Gentiles, white people, African Americans, Latina, Latino people, Native Americans, immigrants, refugees, to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. We're being built together, fellow citizens, members of his household. And I love the word peace here. Because peace requires truth. Peace requires truth. You can't just say, I'm sorry. You're going to make it right. Make it right so there can be peace. Make it right. That's reconciliation. We make it right. Whew. We got a lifetime of work to do. Well, I, I'm ready. Let's go. Right? I, why, I mean, why else would we do anything else? Right? I'm not sitting around watching my clock till I die and go to heaven. Okay, I, we want to show the world, show the neighborhood, yeah. show Grand Rapids yeah. what God's plan was all along, Amen. what God's plan was all along. Amen. Look at that. I'm done. <laughs> Get, come on out, worship band. Come on out, worship band. Amen. I love it. All right, here's the thing. Um, we are one body. If you're a follower of Jesus, so, so if you've committed to follow Jesus as your Savior, we invite you to take communion with us. I want to give you some instructions. A lot of you are new. I'll tell you how we do things here at Mosaic. We're going to have two ways you can take communion right now. Uh, one of them is up here in the front, and we have a, a piece of bread that is gluten-free, and you can dunk that into grape juice, and it is a reminder of what Jesus said the night before he died. He said... Basically, I'm dying on the cross tomorrow. The disciples didn't know what he was talking about. They're doing the Passover meal, and he lifts us up a, a loaf of bread, and he breaks it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He lifted up a glass of wine, and he said, this is my blood, the, new, the, the blood of the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. This new marriage we have with Jesus as Christians, we take this piece of bread, and we drink this little bit of grape juice as a reminder of Jesus making us one new humanity, of a reminder that he destroyed the hostility between us and God and between us and each other. So we invite you, uh, as you are ready, to come forward to take communion. We also, over here along the side, have a, a socially distanced, self-enclosed, there's grape juice and bread all in one uh, piece as another option for you uh, to take communion. Um, at the, and, and following that, we're going to continue in worship. We're going to have some guided time of free worship, and we're going to have a prayer invitation if you'd like to come forward and pray, or in our section leaders will be ready for you uh, to pray as well. So um, I think we just need some sound back here, guys, on the, um, on the keys. Let me pray for us, and we'll enter into a time of communion. God, thank you so much for this vision in Scripture about getting into the game this vision in scripture that we're not just to wear a jersey, but we're to get onto the field. And there's, there's a war going on. <laughs> and, and I want to be in on the action. And we as a church want to be in on the action. And, and letting you shine your light, Jesus. Just shine your light to the world. Shine your light to Grand Rapids. And we are so thankful that you invite us 
You invite us in to this team. And I pray right now for anyone here that doesn't know you as Savior. They've never joined the team. They've never put on that jersey that they would, they would today receive you, Jesus, for the forgiveness of their sins. They would see that they need you. And they would bow the knee humbly before you and say, I need your forgiveness, Jesus. I need you to save me. I need you to be my boss. I need you to be the Lord of my life. And God, for, for those of us that have received that the most amazing gift, we come before you now to remember you through communion. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name.